Welcome, everybody. Didn't mean to shout there. Um, hi, my name is Kathy Hermes, and I'm the publisher of Connecticut Explored, one of the sponsors of this event. And the magazine is in the back. Many of you have taken copies, but if you haven't, we're giving them out tonight because they feature two of the game changers, Pablo Delana and Elena Rosario, who are speaking here tonight. When I talk about the game changers, I want to introduce you to the concept of people who are changing the future of Connecticut history. When we talk about history, we always think of the past, but historians have to look forward. What are the, what are the stories that need to be told for future generations? And Pablo and Elena are doing the work that's laying the foundation for future generations of historians to make a difference in the way we understand our past. Connecticut Explored has been published for 20 years now under the direction of Elizabeth Norman, who just retired as the first publisher, and I'm the second. Um, and we have been committed since the founding of Connecticut Explored to tell one good story after another and to make sure that we're telling all the stories the whole story of Connecticut. So we don't want to leave anybody out. We're always looking for new ideas. Um, we are celebrating our 20th anniversary by, as I say, looking at the future of Connecticut history. The fall issue is about the game changers. The winter issue will be about citizen historians, people who, they don't have any history training necessarily, but some story is important to them or something's changed their life that they want to go out and do a social justice project or they want to write the, the incorrect story that's being told. And so their passion leads them to become citizen historians. Um, and then in the spring issue, we're going to talk about the importance of place, how place matters to the story being told. So. If you're not a subscriber, um, we, we are not an expensive magazine because we are, uh, we are a, um, what is it I want to say, um, non-profit is the word I'm looking for. We're a non-profit magazine, and so for, for anybody who's an educator or a student, the magazine is only $20 a year. For seniors, $25 a year, and for everybody else, $30. Um, we also have a free online newsletter, so if you go to our website, ctexplore.org, you'll get part of our stories and links to our podcasts, Grading the Nutmeg, all for free. So we look forward to having you engage more with the Connecticut Explored experience. Tonight, we want to Welcome Jasmine Augusto, who is going to introduce our Game Changers. And thank you so much for being here. We really love this community and, and love your presence here. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, welcome to the Park Street Library at the Lyric. For those that remember, this used to be the Lyric Theater um, right here on Park Street, and they went and saw films um, right here in this space. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Jasmine Agosto. I'm the Education and Community Outreach Manager for the Hartford History Center at Hartford Public Library, and it is our pleasure, our delight to host this evening. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you haven't already, after this conversation, please check out the exhibit outside. It's called Puerto Ricans Making Hartford Home. The Hartford History Center put this together using a lot of images from our Hartford Times collection, um, which is an incredible resource. And we have photographs from 1950 to 1976, um, of which is a really critical time um, Puerto Ricans, of Puerto Ricans coming into the city and making Hartford home. Um, we're going to get started with two short presentations by Pablo and Elena, and then get into our conversation. We're going to start with Pablo. So for those that don't know, Pablo Delano is a visual artist, photographer, and educator born and raised in Puerto Rico, gracing us with his presence in Hartford in 1996, right? All right. 
He is the Charles A. Dana Professor of Fine Arts at Trinity College in Hartford, and his work has been shown in solo exhibitions in museums and galleries of the U.S., Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Delano is recognized for his use of Connecticut and Puerto Rican history in his work, including his 2020 book of photography, Hartford Scene, which was a Connecticut Book Award 2021 finalist. Over the course of 20 years, Delano amassed a substantial archive related to the century, to a century of Puerto Rican history. Using this material, including 3D objects, newspaper clippings, and photographs, he created the Museum of the Old Colony, a dynamic, site-specific art installation that examines the complex and fraught history of U.S. colonialism, paternalism, and exploitation in Puerto Rico. Without further ado, welcome, Pablo. Uh, you're looking at a page from the Hartford Current from August 30th, 2022. Um, it's an article written by somebody from the New York Times News Service, first published in the New York Times and also reprinted in the Hartford Current. It's an article about uh, a growing call for colonial reparations. Colonial countries demanding that the injustices they suffered because of colonial oppression be addressed by their colonial oppressors. Interesting article, I read it from beginning to end and I read about British colonialism and Spanish colonialism and Portuguese colonialism and Dutch colonialism and all the, all the countries who have, uh, who have uh, held colonies, most of which are free. Guess which colonial uh, country was not mentioned? And guess which colony was not mentioned? Right. right. So, um, Fast forward to today, uh, on the left you can see a chat that I exchanged just this morning with a very dear friend of mine. And on the right you can see a picture that was sent to me yesterday by another friend who is a, a cab driver. And this is her, her cab on the lower right, the, the, white, um, the white roof showing just above the water. Right? So she completely lost her livelihood. Um, This is in Caguas. The text uh, I could translate roughly like this. Um, I asked my friend how he was doing, and he said, good morning. I went to do the shopping at Torre, which is a part of San Juan, uh, completely without electricity, no, hospitals without electricity, um, and the hurricane didn't even really do any serious damage in San Juan. Uh, the corruption here is scary. To which I replied, oh, but I've heard in the news that the Luma, the electric company, is assuring everybody that uh, in, in, a, in a few days um, everything's going to be fine, so everything's cool, right? And he replied, oh, um, um, that's so far from the truth, we're, very, we're in a very bad state. And I replied, obviously, um, they lie with no shame. And he replied, it's terrible the way we allow this to happen. All right, so that is a, an interesting thought because I read his comment as a call to action. And as an artist, I felt a call to action to address this colonial situation, to address the situation of the oldest colony in the world. So I created a conceptual piece of art called the Museum of the Old Colony. It's not a museum, uh, it's an art installation, but it's an art installation that mimics a, a museum in, in certain ways. Uh, inspired in part by this drink, which I'm sure some of you grew, drank as children, and you can still buy it, um, Old Colony. And, incredibly ironic that this is a soft drink that's still sold in the oldest colony. It's called Old Colony. Right? There it is. Um, this is a project that's grown and grown, and I'm not going to talk to you much about this right now because the idea is we're going to just introduce our work briefly and um, then have a conversation. But I'll give you some idea of the kinds of things I've done since arriving in Hartford. So this started out as a small idea of kind of conceptual project that re repurposed and appropriated historical uh, images and objects, and it grew into a really huge project that now it takes up, a, this is about a, a 3,000 square foot gallery in the last iteration. 
Uh, what it has to do with Hartford is that we did a we did a kind of portable version of it on a banner, which was originally shown at Pope Park. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in Brooklyn and Brooklyn Bridge Park, but then we brought it to Hartford and it was shown in Pope Park and, and also Colt Park here, which you can see. Um, so it's a, it uses and recycles and uh, historical photographs, objects, texts, original, un, 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 uh, unaltered in any way. Um, and um, uh, I, I'm starting kind of with my current project because this is an ongoing project uh, and it's, in de- it's still in development even though it's been shown in a number of museums and galleries throughout the country. I'd like to jump way back now to one of the first projects that I got involved with when I arrived in Hartford. So I've always been interested in the role that the arts and music could play in bringing people together. And uh, I've had kind of my own artwork that I do, which has always reflected my interest, but I've also tried to engage the community and the culture of Puerto Rico in all different kinds of ways. For example, uh, way back in the, uh, in the late 90s, there was a festival, a uh, uh, music festival, and I think this was in the, in the recreational center in, in, the, in Pope Park. And the instrument that the man is playing is called a tiple, which I'm, which I'm guessing many of you have never heard of, but you've heard of the cuatro, right? The cuatro is the, the instrument w- that most people know. The tiple is almost, is almost, uh, almost vanished. Um, however, um, uh, I, uh, I have a wonderful friend that some of you may know, William Compiano, who is committed to actually resuscitating, bringing this instrument back to life. So for two years at Trinity, we ran this workshop where people from the community could take this free workshop and actually learn how to build a tiple. William, the luthier, Compiano, was a, is an extraordinary educator as well and figured out a way that these instruments could be built in a way that reflected the traditional way of building them. But uh, when you're done with the workshop, you actually have an instrument that's out there in the world that you can learn how to play. Um, this was a collaboration with Center Church, um, and it was a wonderful, wonderful. I think Chris was, Chris was there, right? Uh, Chris was very helpful. Uh, um, and uh, after the second one, I think I wrote a, this article in, for the Centro Journal about the role that this kind of workshop could play in terms of pedagogy and cultural and activating people to embrace their cultural heritage. Meanwhile, um, I'm driving up and down, driving all around Hartford, and I see stuff, and I want to photograph it. So um, I couldn't help myself. Uh, um, uh, 
I started photographing many of the, you know, it's right there, right? Um, I started photographing uh, all the things that I found visually exciting and things that evoked this rich history of the city to me and the flow and ebb and flow of people and the way and the places where I saw the Caribbean reflected in, 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 in the city. Um, so that kind of became an obsession and I did it for a number of years which resulted in an uh, exhibition at the Hartford Public Library at the Connecticut Historical Society of these, of these uh, of these images, and finally, the publication of this book. Um, uh, so that's my little summary, and, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks to Connecticut Explored for this incredible recognition. And thank you, Dr. Hermes, for your warm welcome. Thanks to the Hartford History Center and the Hartford Public Library for hosting all of us this evening. Thank you to the Park Street Library branch manager, Graciela Rivera, if you're here in the back. <laughs> and uh, thank you for introductions and moderating and putting this all together, Jasmine Augusta. And thank you, Pablo, for that wonderful presentation and for the conversation that we're going to have today. Thank you for the thank you. <laughs> As uh, we already said, my name is Elena Marie Rosario, and I'm a public historian from Hartford, Connecticut. I'm going to speak a little uh, briefly about my work to provide some context, but I'm really looking forward to the conversation. The image that you see in front of you is uh, on the cover, on the front and back cover, cover of Pablo Delano's book, Hartford Seed. This image was taken in 2010. The image shows two churches, and on the um, right, you can see one of the churches, the one with the white and green writing, and it says, Iglesia de Dios Pentecostal Teslonica. The sign on the church, which is really small in the second window there, reads Reverend Arturo Madera. He's been the pastor at that church on Broad Street for 35 years, and he was ordained 40 years. He's been ordained as a Pentecostal pastor for the last 40 years. Reverend Madera presented me in front of God when I was an infant. He also happens to be my maternal uncle. I wanted to start with this image because uh, Pablo and I had a lot to talk about when I found this image on his website, um, but also because it just highlights how deep and how deeply rooted my scholarship is in my identity as a Puerto Rican woman of the Hartford diaspora. My project could not be possible without the many communities that have supported me, many of which are here today, and my family that always valued education and my interest in history. My dissertation project, currently titled Puerto Rican Tobacco Migration, Post-War Settlement and Community Development in Hartford, Connecticut, 1947 to 1973, intervenes in historical inter interpretations of Connecticut and American history by working within the community to document and curate material through oral histories, local archival research, and publicly engaged projects. This is a table from a book uh, called Sponsored Migration that came out in 2017. And as you can see, right on the top of this is Connecticut. 
Um, and I wanted to show you all this because uh, for those of you that are not from Hartford or not from Connecticut, uh, it's very easy to see the history of Puerto Ricans in Connecticut as a very recent thing. Um, people can kind of point to specific moments when we had a Puerto Rican mayor or when you have Puerto Rican migration that came after Hurricane Maria. But as you can see on this map uh, here, as early as 1955, and I actually argue as early as 1952, Puerto Ricans were already coming to Connecticut in significant numbers. My research examines the development of the early Puerto Rican community in Hartford to uncover the silences in the region's history and speak to the lack of Puerto Rican stories in the archives and secondary history curriculum. As of 2019, Connecticut has the most significant percentage of Puerto Rican residents of any U.S. state at 8.5%. The city of Hartford has about 100,000 Puerto Ricans many of which are in this room. And our stories and our contributions to the city continue to remain unexamined. Through education, I learned that silences are not simply in the archive, but also in the way that we preserve, collect, and distribute materials for education. So my project uses a range of methods, research methods like archival research, oral histories, curriculum design, and community-centered research. And here you have some pictures. Um, on the, the picture on the right is me with Jasmine and uh, Ray, which is a, he's a student at Trinity College here in Hartford. And I was showing him what is available at the Hartford History Center in the archives um, as part of a community project that, we were, that I helped consult on at Trinity College last summer. Uh, the other I image on the screen is a screenshot of a video uh, from StoryCorp's mobile tour, and I'm interviewing my mother um, about her experience migrating to Connecticut. Um, and Sacred Heart Church, for those Puerto Ricans in the room, has a lot of meaning. And my mom, uh, that's where she had her first communion, so we were talking about that in that, in that screenshot. So one of my primary goals uh, is to make sure that historical material is, is available to the public and to non-academics. Um, and that is because I wanted to be able to narrate the social and cultural impact that Puerto Ricans have, uh, on, have made on Hartford. Um, and so part of that work is also, part of that public work is writing curriculum. So for those of you who know uh, who may not know, in 2019, the state of Connecticut passed uh, Connecticut Public Act 1912, titled The Inclusion of Black and Latino Studies in the Public School Curriculum. Uh, it's being implemented currently right now for the, uh, for the first time after a pilot year. Um, and for those of us who grew up in Connecticut public schools and didn't get to see ourselves in the curriculum, this is a very exciting project. Um, and I've been really uh, blessed with the honor of being asked to help write curriculum for this project. Um, and so abiding by the Connecticut Elementary and Social Studies frameworks, um, I wrote four lesson plans for Connecticut Humanities. Uh, they have a digital resource called teachitconnecticut.org, which is available online for teachers and families and anyone who wants uh, to learn about Connecticut specific history. Um, and so I'm just highlighting two of my lesson plans. One was on the uh, post-World War II migration, and the other one was on the first Puerto Rican Day Parade. Um, and part of what the goals for, these pro for this uh, curriculum design and for all of my research is to really make sure that it is both culturally informed, it is, uh, centers the public audience, and it highlights local resources and the work that the communities have already done. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the conversation. How do you personally come to this work? We know that right, y'all are doing this work that's that's gonna be really impactful and is already impactful in Connecticut and Hartford uh, and beyond, but like, you know, how does you your personal journey, um, you know, where you come from bring meaning to your work? So whoever wants to start. Uh, and you guys, these can, there you go. Well, that's a very easy question because 
and I can give you a very short answer. I, I just thought that I really didn't have any choice. That's the answer. I, I why? Know. Like, why didn't you have a choice? <laughs> because where I come from and and uh, my my upbringing and, 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 and those, you know, the, 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 uh, everything that I was surrounded by, you know, as a child and growing up, uh, made a profound, profound impact that in me and on me and uh, affected the way I think and who I am and my whole way of thinking and my way of thinking about myself, my way of thinking of others. And, um, and, uh, and it's always been present in my work. But perhaps the one thing that is different is that uh, is, is that at about about six or seven years ago, um, I found a new way and a more direct way to address the situ- the, the question of Puerto Rico. And honestly, what it had to do with was with uh, the, the creation of the Promesa Law, which was a which was a uh, for those some of you who may not know, but uh, in uh, two, 2016, I think it was uh, President Obama signed a a, a law that imposed a fiscal control board on the island that basically stripped away any premise of self-government because all economic decisions had to be made and approved and uh, by this federally appointed board, not by locally elected officials. This was in response to a so-called debt crisis, which you might say is a result of an onerous debt or an illegitimate debt, which was created by a whole history of colonialism. Uh, in any case, that kind of uh, was a kind of breaking point, and I felt that I needed to address these issues head on and directly and call them out. Um, and so that was sort of the beginning of the project that's called the Museum of the Old Colony, which then has many iterations, including the banner in Hartford. Previously, I spent about 10 years photographing in Trinidad in the West Indies, and that was uh, groundbreaking and very, very important for me because I got to see what, I, what it looked like to be a post Colonial, in the post-colonial world, right? to, to, to have been a colony and to have achieved independence and then to try to, 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 to be uh, uh, totally engrossed, involved in the struggle of trying to define yourself as a new nation. Um, but maybe that answers. Okay. And that speaks to a lot of the framing of our conversations, tonight in terms of the relationship between the U.S. and Puerto Rico. And I think we'll get into that a little bit more. But I, I just want to follow up. When you say my upbringing, like, for those that don't know, what was, why, like, how did, like, why even photography? You know, like, can you just speak a little bit to that? No, I don't want to talk about that. I want to, <laughs> okay. I want to talk about reaching up and picking up a guayaba and having and biting into it. And if it was really good, it had a worm, right? The good ones had the worm, the pink ones. Right? Okay, all right. That's important, too. <laughs> Elena? Can you come to this work, you know, personally, your personal journey? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, uh, I always like learning and uh, reading and teaching and, um, or I guess you could say I was nosy and asked a lot of questions all the time. Um, so I think it was kind of a given that I was going to go into a field that was going to ask inquiry some way or another. I think in the beginning, uh, my parents wanted me to be a lawyer um, because I also like to talk and debate and other things. Um, But my love for learning really and teaching really came early. um, And along with my love for learning and teaching, I realized that there was a lack in my education. And I really struggled uh, with kind of trying to figure out how was it that I grew up in the North End, you know, and so how was it, and you know, I also spent a lot of time here on Park Street, you know, how was it that I saw all this cultural expression and beautiful, you know, flags and churches and all these community events that were being put on um, by Puerto Ricans, but I never, like, learned about that in school, or I never realized, like, no one ever talked about Puerto Ricans as having any history besides it being negative in the city. Um, And so for me, I really started by asking questions to my family, you know, about our history and our past and and learning more about that. Um, And what really, and I would say when I started college, I thought I had everything in my head and I knew I was like, I'm going to be a historian. 
Um, but I had a professor tell me that I only wanted to be a, a teacher because that's what all uh, Spanish girls want to do. And um, that really, really hit home for me and being a first generation college student. And so I, I took my questions about colonialism and belonging and I tried to make it more legitimate for academia. So I ended up studying uh, British colonialism for a long time. I wrote an undergrad thesis on that. Eventually you might read an article about it. They're trying to make me write an article. Um, I, went to under, I went to University of Michigan thinking I was gonna write about the British Atlantic world. And uh, then Hurricane Maria happened. And I was also going through a lot of other things. And it was just a big realization that you know, no one should tell you one, tell you what you should study. But also that if no one else was gonna tell this story, you know, I need to tell this story and also who better to tell this story than someone from the community that cares about that story. Um, and so I said, forget that man. Well, there was other more colorful words if you know me, but there's children in the audience. Um, and that's how I came back to this project. And I think that's why it means uh, so much. Um, because a lot of us, even those of us who go through education, we're still getting pushed down, you know, on the way up. And that's why this is so important, both in regular public history, but also in the academic world of history, um, more broadly. Thank you so much. For those in the room, um, you know, even if you're not Puerto Rican, but where did you learn the most about who you were? Like, who you were, your identity? Um, the, the reason why I ask is because you know, there's images outside as well that speak to this, right? Where like, so much of who we learn about is in the home or in our own communities and our, in our own neighborhoods more than like in the classroom. And I think that's, that, that's like, there's a long history of that that speaks to that. And here we are as like scholars trying to really push this work in, in academics and education and in the school system so that everybody, um, can learn about who they are, right, and feel connected to this greater history. Um, I just wanted to point that out, that this is, I don't know if, if others feel that way too. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, you know, as both of you guys mentioned, kind of this push that happens, right? You guys have a connection to the island of Puerto Rico in different ways. Um, are doing work on right mainland US. Um, and you guys both, both speak to these important moments, Promesa, Hurricane Maria, and these kind of pushing you further to do the work that you want to do um, and, and, and tackle things head on. So can you speak to um, how the relationship between the US and Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico really frames all of our study, our lived experience, our story sharing of Puerto Rico, of Puerto Rico and Puerto Rico's Puerto Ricans on and off the island. How does this relationship frame our work? Okay. <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, well, obviously, I mean, to first start off, uh, and one of the biggest things that I uh, talk about in, in the introduction, you talk about the Daughters of American Revolution, which um, is a very politicized organization. I won't spend too much time talking about them. But I will say that I have always found it ironic that they gave a fifth grade Puerto Rican girl an award in Outstanding American History uh, as someone who could never actually join the organization because I don't have any family members that go back to the Mayflower. Um, so I can't actually join that organization, but it's like supposed to be an honor that they recognize me, um, which is like super complicated. And so I wanna mention that because I think that that is a perfect example, is an example of the way that American history has a very one story, a one narrative of what American history is. Um, and when you're talking about American history in the, in the 20th century, so any time after you know, 1900, you're talking about America as a colonial power. You're talking about America as a exclusionary state America as a, a place that is creating world policies on immigration, on labor, 
Um, and that is really, really important, but it's a lot easier to just say, okay, this is American history, it's the Civil War, it's Mark Twain, it's, it's very, you know, that's a very easy narrative. And what's a lot harder is to actually take the history that we know and add new perspectives into that. And that is what's really important about understanding the colonial relationship between the U.S. and Puerto Rico because it shapes everything. Regardless of, uh, what, regardless of the fact that it was in 1917 that the Jones Act passed, or in 1952 that the ELA passed, all of those laws are deeply, they all, they're passed through generations. So even though I wasn't there when, 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 the, when Americans occupied Puerto Rico and took it from Spain, that is in my history. That is our story. And so we cannot just put that, what a lot of times American historians like to do is place Puerto Rican history with Latin American history, which is fine because it is a part of that history, but to completely omit it from American history is to, is to literally lie and pretend that, the Ameri that America is not a colonial power and we know that it is and we know that it is still today. Um, and so I'll just stop there, but the main thing, and Pablo already mentioned this, but it is just important to remember that not only is Puerto Rico the oldest colony in the world, but America is, is who, is, who is, is the occupier of that colony, and we need to address that. Um, but America doesn't want to address that. So that's why our curriculums are written in a certain way, where we have a melting pot where we all come here and we all take away the hyphen and we just become American. Yes, sir. So, in response to your question, two words come to mind. One is erasure and one is genocide. Um, I was just thinking about this horrible thing that's just happened, right? Five years after Hurricane Maria. Again, again, right? And so you're thinking of, okay, so surely this, surely there's gonna be these giant airplanes filled with supplies taking off every five minutes, right? There's gonna be this massive effort and, and they're gonna be bringing helicopters to get to the, to the, to the places in the mountains where all the roads were washed out, and they're gonna. No, no. There's no big airplanes taking off, full of full of supplies. Nothing. No, nothing. Nothing. There's no. And and think of the event, the political card that Biden could could play by saying, "Oh, you know, well, Trump didn't do anything, but we're then even that, right?" So it's just erasure everywhere. Everywhere you look, at it is erasure, right? And. I don't know how many of you have seen the new video, the Bad Bunny's new video, right? But this is important, this is a really important video. So it's like, because what's happening in Puerta de Tierra is happening all across the island. Uh, it's it's, um, it's uh, uh, outsiders taking advantage of tax laws to come in and buy up properties, people getting evicted, not being able to find a place to live, people who lived in, in places for 20, 30, 40 years, their whole lives in these little apart apartments, suddenly they, you know, the, the, they, they, have to, they have to be, they're being kicked out because they, they, they pay $400 rent, and after they leave, the place is gonna be Airbnb, and it's gonna be $150 a night, right? On and on and on. So, I'm not sure if I, but I'm just, you know, this is, now, this is today. This is today, this is now. And, 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 and erasure, right? Erasure, like, because it's the direction that this is going in is to make it impossible for people from Puerto Rico to stay there, assimilate, get out. I don't know if you guys can speak, I'll just mention this quickly and then change and then shift, but. Um, you know, one thing that, that I have seen and uh, just with following a lot of like independent groups, artists, activists, groups, mutual aid groups, um, even just talking to everyday people that are trying to survive, right, is that the U.S. is not coming. The companies like Numa and companies like that that are getting a lot of money, billions of dollars from the U.S. are not actually doing the job that they're supposed to be doing. 
And so Puerto Ricans themselves are having to have that self-determination, right? That their folks, everyday folks, are trying to help each other out through mutual aid um, support, through actually shoveling the wreckage, through um, you know, water collection systems, their own generator system, all these other things to be able to survive and combat the fact that U.S. not coming for them, right? Um, and for our folks. Um, and I, I want us to shift that conversation to about kind of the our self-determination, our resistance work, um, in even being public historians and doing photography and doing and, and being able to share our own stories. So if we can kind of shift the story to the, the conversation to talk about y'all's work as self-determination work and you know, what is the process and practice of photography, of seeking visual material in the archive, or creating it literally because it doesn't exist, right? Um, how, it's, how it's critical to locate, create, and share stories of Puerto Ricans. So, as you mentioned and I talked about, I, I have a project called the Museum of the Old Colony, right? This is a project in which, in which utilizes photography, but not one single photograph in this project is a photograph I took or I made. Okay? I appropriate historical photographs. And um, I do that for, the, 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 the project can be read in two, in two ways. The, the photographs in this project are very difficult. They're really quite horrible. They're, they are photographs, they, they are, they are photographs that were taken by the colonizer when the colonizer arrived in order to sell the colonial, the colonial experience, the colonial experiment to others in North America. And the colonizer brought all the <coughs> problematic attitudes, all the racism that was here, there, and applied it there, and applied it through visual means. So some of these photographs are very tough to look at. They're hurtful. At the same time, it's important to see them. So it's important for people in Puerto Rico to see the way that the colonizer depicted us, right? And it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a call, it's, a, it's shocking, it's an awakening, and I think, and I hope, it's a call to action. At the same time, this project has been exhibited quite a lot in the mainland United States. The project is in the permanent collection of the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Juan, which, by the way, I'm very pleased and happy to say has opened since Hurricane Fiona, not to show the art, but to let people come in and charge their phones. I mean, it's an amazing institution. They've set up uh, computers and, and phone banks and places for people to come and, you know, uh, you know get access to the internet and whatnot. Um, the other side of the coin, though, is that it's important for Americans to see the way that their country uh, portrayed us because um, Americans need to come to terms with this as well. Uh, yeah, so I am thinking about, can you ask the question again? Sorry, <laughs> I, have, yeah. I have notes, but I want to make sure I answer it. Yeah, I, I was kind of shifting us to think about like, well, what is the, the significance of, like, of like, finding or creating yeah. the, the story? Yeah, so um, I think kind of what we're talking about, um, and one thing that I have really um, learned, I would say, from you know oral histories or interviewing people or just my own lived experience, um, in terms of resistance. Um, so I, I actually like study resistance. So I study you know the civil rights movement and like actual social movements. So I could give you a very you know academic version of that resistance in or self determination in the way that I think about my work um, is just the daily the daily act of resisting um, the you know discipline of history. As <laughs> um, I love history, that's my discipline. I have you know multiple degrees in it, um, but it is a very deeply flawed uh, discipline that has uh, has often favored certain voices over others um, and as a institution as an institutional discipline it also you know it's not as progressive as some other academic institutions and so one of the resistance that I do is actually being a historian um, and so you know when I was applying to graduate school I had a lot of different 
graduate program that could do. I could do American culture, or American studies, I could do anthropology, I could do political science, I could do history, I could do sociology, um, and I was, or I could do ethnic studies, and I was really intentional about doing history. And that was because I didn't have a Puerto Rican historian in my um, college, and I wanted to talk about Puerto Rican history, and so I had to talk to everybody else about Puerto Rican history, except for someone in the history department. And so I wanted to be that person, that that historian that could talk about Puerto Ricans to, to my students, right? Um, and like I have already said, I wanted to be someone that could say, this discipline, this time period in American history is not just black and white, it's not just white people, or it's not just rich people, it's not just one version of the story. Um, and that's kind of, so that's kind of the resistance that I have. But the other, the other thing I want to mention is also this quiet resistance, which is that, and, and that's what I would like to call, that's the community resistance, and that's really what I see all the time, right? And so in my work, like, my work is just highlighting the history that's already been here for 50, 60 years. I just want to make sure that we take, we collect those stories before those people pass away, because we've already lost so many people that were important in those stories. And so, but the work is ongoing, right? So the next, the next book, you know, I'm just gonna, once I finish in 73, I gotta start in 74, and then the next project continues, right? And then you gotta talk about the 70s and the 80s, which was a crazy, you know, a huge time for the city. And then the 90s, right? And then we'll, we'll come all the way back up to today and talk about the work that Jasmine's been doing, right? And so, and that's part of the project, right? But you have to start the project where the story started. And so that's the resistance that I really do is, is by starting the story with the working class, with the tobacco migration, and with that early that early group um, to really tell the full story of how we all got here. And, and I would just add that it's very important that you do this work because we're facing erasure. And if you don't do it, it's not gonna, if we don't do it, it's not gonna get done. It's very important work. Period. And um, that was my next question is like, whose story is important, right? And that, and so you got right to it, right? It's not just the, all the professional Puerto Ricans who made it and all of that, right? But just everyday folks. Um, and so I think that both of y'all's work speaks to that too. It's like the everyday businesses, the everyday folks um, that we can connect to. Um, so thank you for that work. Um, Last question, and I want to open up to, because I think we're actually going to have a little bit of time for audience questions. Okay, so, um, is there such thing as a Hartford region? Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, what does that um, identity mean in comparison to the New Rican, for example? Is there like North End versus South End kind of situation? What is the gener generational legacy of Puerto Rican identity and livelihood in Harvard? So I know it's kind of like a bigger question, but I just want to put that out there. I'm sure people in the room can also speak to this. Yeah. So is there like a specific Har Harvard Rican yeah, experience or identity? <laughs> Okay, um, so, so yeah, so every, uh, most of y'all have heard of your weekend, it has, like, it's, it has its own kind of term. Um, we have an expert on your weekend over here, I won't make her speak, but if you really want to get into it. Um, but I, I would, I, so I personally say that I am a Puerto Rican Harvard diaspora. Um, I think Hartford weekend is a, is an interesting term that we can use, and I think if people want to use that term, then yeah, we can go ahead and make it an academic term. I personally don't think that I want to create the term. Um, <laughs> that's a lot of work when you create a term in academia, right? You have to have all the theories and everything behind it. Um, in terms of a way to categorize people, yeah, there are, you know, Puerto Ricans in Hartford, we are different than Puerto Ricans in Waterbury. We're different than Puerto Ricans in New Haven. Uh, you know, we're, Different important in Bridgeport, right? Um, and I think what this question 
kind of talked about, and it's something that I, I really try to emphasize in my work, is that when we say Puerto Rican, well, at least when I say Puerto Rican community, I mean multiple communities, right? It's not, the Puerto Rican community is not a monolithic thing. So that's also why I'm hesitant to say Hartford Puerto Rican, because we're not one thing, right? So I'm a Hartford Puerto Rican from the North End, but my experience is not the same as the Hartford Puerto Rican from the South End, right? Just like my, you know, when my mom first came here, she moved, you know, off of Main Street, and that kind of early set, that early group of Puerto Rican migrants. Whereas by the time my dad got here, he moved to Zion Street, right over here. The, the, the stuff, you know, some of those other Puerto Ricans, that's where they ended up uh, living, and so, and like that's where, you know, they they ended up living. And I think I was born around. I think we were living over there. Um, but anyway, the point is to say is that um, I start in the North End with that community because that is where you know the tobacco buses actually picked up tobacco workers. That's where um, that's you know how you get straight into you kind of go straight from you know up up Main Street and you go all the way into Windsor, the Windsor Line. Um, and so that's why that particular area is really like a center of my story. Um, but that doesn't mean that the Puerto Rican population that started in the South End is not, you know, is not the same. And the more and more I do oral history, the more I realize that those communities were actually starting at the same time. Um, and a lot of it was just one Puerto Rican moving to the street, right? So like one Puerto Rican decided to go to Garden Street, and then everyone else moved, <laughs> moved to Garden Street. Um, and so that's how you, that's how those communities started happening. So yes, there are Harper Puerto Ricans. I don't know if Harper Rican is a term. Maybe in this room we can come up with a term that we feel that identifies, you know, identifies us. Um, but I don't think it has gone to the point where it's its own collective identity to the point of what Rio Rican is. It's not to say that we can't get there. I do think that it's just we're a younger community and we just haven't had those conversations yet. So it hasn't, we haven't created that space, but maybe follow up. Maybe we're doing that right now. So I, I really can't add much to that, but I would, just a couple of observations. It is interesting that to uh, to know that um, that uh, there are some geographic areas in the Africa more much more heavily represented here than 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 others. Like there are several businesses that have the name Comerio. There's Comerio Market. There's Comerio Restaurant, which is closed, and that takes me to the other point, which is that. But it's interesting to put this in the context of the history of Hartford as a as a city. It's always been a, a place to which people moved. We look at the history of the North End, you know, it, which was so so solidly Jewish, and, and now all of a sudden these synagogues, which are being used and are still places of spiritual worship, but they're not no longer Jewish. Interestingly. The places the people who are using them now as places of worship have not felt any need to take off the Hebrew writing and this all. So, I mean, that, that's a very beautiful thing, I think. Uh, yeah, but also, um, uh, you may have noticed in the video, in my little video that I showed in, in the Mercado, there was a restaurant called Bushnanga. That was a very busy uh, Puerto Rican restaurant, which is no longer there. It's been replaced by a Dominican restaurant. So, it's I think there's, you know, this, this, things are just in this constant flux that part of the equation. Yeah, um, I just want to add that, yeah, I think it is important, and that's another reason why I, like, the Harvard region as a, you know, it's not a monolithic group, because when you actually do the research, you know, early Puerto Ricans were coming from, you know, Comerillo, Calle, Caguas, um, people were coming from all over, and a lot of those, you, we remain, we still see that, right? So there's like, uh, you know, maybe Calle Tires, there's all these different places, and places like in Bridgeport, there's like a Taino barbecue, you know, um, and so all over Connecticut, you have those those remnants of, you know, not only, so it's like, we're also Puerto Ricans that were coming from all over the island as well. Um, and so that gets that kind of, all of that mingled in and creates events here. And one of the things that I'll just mention is, there was a video playing outside here, um, and it was a it was a showing an event at Sacred Heart Church, uh, Comerio de Sentes, and it was an event that was part was a festival that was from Comerio, 
and they, the Hartford Puerto Ricans at the time, they brought that festival to Hartford to represent the community of Comido, and that is, was very common. Um, then that was something that was very common to happen. Um, and you know, we get Puerto Rican parades in Hartford now, you'll still see people with their flags from their individual towns, um, even and the Puerto Rican flag as well. So, so it's hard to you know create that because like. It's complex. <laughs> but the levels of complexity are pretty, yeah. are pretty deep. But yeah. The levels and levels, for example, I was thinking of uh, not far from here on Hillside Avenue, there's a place called El Moro, El Moro Supermarket. We have good food and have food. And, but, and people are very proud of El Moro, right? The old Spanish focus in Guillermo San Juan. But at the same time, El Moro is a symbol of Spanish colonialism. Uh -huh. But also, isn't that story is owned by the Olympians now? So, isn't that pretty? It's just saying, that's where it is. And a shout out to Akina Ero, who provides the food tonight. And the original Akina Ero is on Albany Avenue. It's still there. And we have Akina Ero right here on Park Street. So that also shows that North and South End connection. So we have. Yes, we have a little bit of time, so definitely open up to questions in the audience. And I'm actually, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to mention that uh, Akime Quiero is going to be celebrating its 52, 52nd year in business uh, on the 25th. Uh, they're going to have a little block party and stuff, and that's also going to be when the city of Harper is doing Domingo, which is an event where they'll close out the streets so people can ride their bikes or walk in the city. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight that, but that is a, a big, a huge pillar in our community as well, um, that restaurant. And it's still family owned. <coughs> Thank you. Yes. Can you, yeah, see if you put that in them that's not all around the point. Uh, you both spoke on erasure and resilience, and both all work in representation and education. Do you feel as though our language, which is Puerto Rican's version of Spanish, has been touched in the nation and the country. Should we also represent it in our speech and speech and European Spanish? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. I was just talking to someone about this, uh, someone who is like, I would say, one of the best educators ever, bilingual educators, uh, Edna Negron, uh, somebody who knows her. Um, and I was just talking about this, and uh, yes, I think, and part of why the work, the curriculum that I do is culturally informed and relevant, um, and so I didn't mention this, but part of what, what Connecticut Humanities asked me to write this curriculum, I told them that I would do it if they would translate it, um, which, which is not something that they have did with any of the curriculum. And I told them that I didn't want to translate it, but I would find someone too. And I found a Puerto Rican translator to translate it. Um, and so there are Spanish versions of these. Um, but that was really important to me, right? Because it's not, I wanted to make sure that ESL students also know this important history. This content is still important, even if you're not, uh, even if English is not your first language. Um, that is something very small, right? Um, yes, I do think, and I think all teaching and all education should be culturally informed, and that's you know that's just part of my value and pedagogy. Um, but this has been an issue, and in the art and the history, this is an issue. So Puerto Ricans in the fifties talk about how when they go to court in Hartford, that the people translating are you know Argentinians or um, people from academics from Yale are translating for Puerto Ricans in Harvard and the court and they're not, it's not linking up. And so this has been an issue. Um, and I think the only way that we can really change it is that it's really by educators um, and also families and communities advocating for that and saying, you know, in this community we need, you should be including vocabulary from the language that is around and not telling kids that's wrong, which is like what happened to me when I said a learning class and was told that's not the right word. Instead, it should say, well, that's one word, one version of the word, here's another version. How can we speak together? 
I really appreciate the question because it also brings up another question, which is the nature of Spanish, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and and and, and I mean, you asked the question really, so I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, talk a lot about this, but it seems to me like um, Spanish, the, the cultural contribution of the Spanish should be recognized, and also uh, and also. Uh, a piece of work like that will get these Puerto Rican obituary should be taught in every high school. Mm -hmm. Not just here, not in every high school in this country. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that piece of, that's a very important piece of work that needs to be taught to everybody in this country. Yeah, I have a comment. Um, the original Spanish that was taught was from Spain, but um, in school, they're not teaching that correct Spanish. Yes, I do agree that you change it to the culture that's right there. That way for people understand, like she mentioned about court. They're using other type of culture of Spanish to translate, and they're not translated properly, because here uh, uh, you find a Puerican that never spoke English, does not know nothing about English, and they, they're translating in a certain language that I do not understand. I do agree that they should, you know, upgrade the teaching. Um, there's also footage, um, speaking to that point, and what you guys are talking about, there's footage of Maria Sanchez and her colega talking about the need, like how they were bringing in all these other... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you said, sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, well, so there's the other footage in 1969 with Miley Sanchez and her. Did you already say this? I didn't mention. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, right. So there's there's footage of her talking um, in her bodega about like the need for Puerto Rican translators in the court system um, versus having folks from other coming to other places that spoke Spanish because of the, the differences in the, in the dialect here. And you know, I just find this conversation very interesting and enlightening. In fact, when I walked in here, I thought that we were going to have una presentación y las preguntas y todo eso en español. So, you know, and, and there was no checking of todo el mundo español, todo el mundo inglés, entiende la gente, you know? I know we were gonna check and then I talked with Gaciela and we, we switched we switched to the last minute, so I'm sorry for that. I just Jen, I just told Jen had a comment first. Oh go ahead, yeah. It, was there any I mean if, if you have a question and you want to say it in Spanish, I'm happy to answer in English or if you have a translator. I mean we do have someone who can translate. So if there is anyone that wants to ask a question in Spanish, you're definitely able to answer that. Jen, what was that? I just wanted to like, uh, add that it was, y'all have that accordion on my position then? It's online. Online? I think she's interviewed by a priest, right? Yeah, there's a priest up there from Sacred Heart Church. Um, and it, the footage is all on the Connecticut Digital Archive. And actually, when you walk out, um, you can there's like QR codes of all of the different films that are there from 1969, and two of them are with Maria Sanchez and her shop. Do we know what you've done? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I you know, I, I went to the Hartford Public School System, was born and raised in Hartford. And yeah, and I've been there. And so I, 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 I remember, um, I remember seeing all of my Spanish teachers, all my Puerto Rican teachers. My mother would call them La Plantitas. They were all white. And I still, I, I, and it wasn't until I got Mrs. Negro who said, Esta es la primera negrita maestra. And she wouldn't even talk to my mom about that. My mom was a black Puerto Rican woman who was very proud. 
And, 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 and that, that feeling that we were not, there was something we didn't fit in also because of the native food. And then when I went to Puerto Rico as an adult, I often would, would, was made fun of for saying pal, comer, and it's, it's a struggle. And that's why I call myself a hard to reckon, because I'm still proud of saying pal carajo. Voy a comer, voy a lonchar. And I feel comfortable saying those things. But I remember growing up feeling I'm not this, I'm not that, I, I, I don't know, um, I don't see negritud in the professionals that were coming in. And it wasn't until I had Mrs. Negron, and Negron, as a teacher that I saw my first uh, uh, teacher that looked like my mother, looked like me. She had the nose features, the hair, and it, and it felt real. And so my point is, is that we talk about American colonialism, which I agree 100%, but we also have to start with the Spanish colonialism, and we cannot ignore that. And so I think it's like that double jeopardy that we've experienced, that we've always been a colony under Spain and under uh, the United States. And if we ignore, we, 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 I remember celebrating the Los Años de Cristóbal Colón and Rafael Hernández spending millions of dollars to bring back the ships. Everyone remembers that? But nobody talked about esclavitud. I went to the University of Puerto Rico looking to see if they had anything on black culture zero, and yet it's this push and pull. And so how, how does your work speak to that? How does it include the colonial, I mean, in, in Pablo, I've seen your work, but how does it, how does it talk about negritud? All of those other gender, identity, sexuality, that, that, that seems to be silent at times when I go, to shows or exhibitions, it, it's almost like, mm -mm, no te atrevas, don't even talk about it. Um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so I am very aware of these things, and uh, I want to go back to the Spanish question because I did mention this because I thought it was going to be too much of a tangent. Um, but I like, I always bring up Spanish colonialism as well. Um, and I, oftentimes when people want to like release language, I'm always like, well, you know, Spanish is also the language of the colonizers. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's okay if I don't speak Spanish correct, like 100% correctly either. Um, and I think a lot of people in my generation are <laughs> we're really fighting that a lot more. Um, and trying to make, you know, and show the cultural significance of things like Spanish or of, of these like multilingual, you know, households and, and languages and things like that. Um, so I think that that's crucial. Uh, for me, I, yeah, growing up, I, the Puerto Ricans that I did see that were um, professional were often, you know, lighter or, or white Puerto Ricans or white identity-looking Puerto Ricans, um, and that was definitely something that was not, I definitely understood that, and um, and I think that that's uh, really important as to why, again, I start my work with really looking at marginalized groups by starting with the working class, because when you start with the working class, uh, it's not to say that race doesn't exist, but again, it it's a lot more uh, nuanced, um, and so you do have uh, opportunities to have people actually be able to talk about you know their experiences of being a certain racial identity and also being Puerto Rican. Um, so that is super important. I am you know, a lot of my project talks about women because women, I mean women are I would say the backbone of the Puerto Rican yes. family. Yes. <laughs> and, so I'm not going to uh, and most of the Puerto Ricans that did a lot of really amazing things in here in Hartford were women. Yeah. Hartford women did. So they have to be talked about. Um, and so I definitely talk about that. 
Um, in terms of things like sexuality, that is more of what the people I talk to give me, right? So if I'm interviewing someone and they talk to me about their sexuality, if they talk to me about their experience being a black Puerto Rican, then obviously I censor that. You know, I try to um, let people know that, they, that it, it's a comfortable space for them to bring those identities to talk to me, but that doesn't necessarily mean everyone is comfortable talking about that or really also understands the dynamics. Um, and so really it's just my job to make sure that I'm getting as many diverse perspectives as I can, um, but also being able to ask those questions that you know, I have that both that experience of living in the city, so I can ask questions like I was doing a oral history with Edna and the Grove this past weekend, and we were talking about the North End, and you know, she mentioned living on Garden Street, and I was like, yeah, I can see that from my, you know, my house right now, um, and that's the kind of work that is that's that's what I see as bringing voices to those stories, um, but but it still needs to be done, and it's not easy. I think it's important to remember too that that uh, the abolition of slavery in Puerto Rico was very late. Mm. Very late. It was one of the last places where slavery was abolished. And there's been a lot of studies comparing um, comparing uh, uh, Spanish colonial attitudes about race versus the American attitudes about race, which were I'm not gonna say one is better than the other, but we're both pretty awful, right? But 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 it was very it was quite different. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the Spanish colonial period, for example, it was very much frowned upon for a Spaniard to marry a black woman or a, or a, or a person of indigenous, but uh, to, but it was but it was um, it was tolerated if it was a, a good Catholic marriage. You know? <laughs> so so it's it very. Quite very, very different. The, the, the U.S. brand of racism was especially horrible, you know, especially cruel, um, uh, and that's reflected in a lot of the materials that I work with from the from the early from the 1898, the first few years when a lot of photographers were sent. Um, I just mentioned that um, you know this project has been exhibited. A lot of different places, and I always try to respond to the location, the specific location. So the last major installation of the project was at James Madison University mm -hmm. in Virginia. Yep. So I made a particular effort to highlight the way that, um, partly because a lot of the soldiers that were sent were from the south, mm -hmm. because it was closer. You know, there wasn't like now they fly. There was no airplane, so it was like, who's going to get to the closest ship? And so. Um, so uh, I made a particular effort to, to include uh, examples of the most uh, egregious kinds of ideas about race that were composed. Infantilization is another technique that was used by the colonial, uh, by the, the, the US colonial powers in the beginning. They tried to depict uh, us as uh, innocent little creatures who could be saved by Uncle Sam. There's some of that in Christopher Columbus, too. Of course, yeah. Um, I just wanted to add real quick um, that just just like blackness and Puerto Rican identity has to be, it has to be, it's, it, is, it is there, right? It is part of, it is who we are, and it has to be in, in it has to be visible in everything that we do when we talk about Puerto Rican history. And some of it is just like, if we just look at images, if we just look at the footage, black Puerto Ricans are here, right? If we look all around us in our communities, we're here. So, um, you know, there's like really in-depth work when we're talking about the colonial project and the treatment of, of, of black white was. Um, that is there, that's in the record. Um, there's incredible work by Boricua genealogists that are looking to um, kind of dig in and, and see like how do we trace our black ancestry. Um, there's a lot of work that's being done that's not necessarily by the Harvard History Center or Public Library, but it's here. Um, and so for those that are interested, like let's stay in touch because there's, there's some incredible work that's happening um, out here.
but also let's let's put it out there, right? Because some of you, I mean, I'm sure some some of you are familiar with this, but it's always preferable to be tiny than to be black. Right? This is my yeah, yeah. And but also it's encouraging to see some of the uh, some signs of the recognition of, of, of maybe blue inverted from now with the Coheor Afro, which is being created by Matalaya Vega, Matalaya Vega, and and, uh, and uh, uh, much more acknowledgement and the popularity of Bomba. I mean, Bomba has grown enormously. Uh, every Friday at 5 p.m. there's a there's a toque de bomba in La Pena. Yeah. Uh, it was in San Bernardino. You know, so. <laughs> 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 you like that. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, um, it's about that time to wrap up, so I just want to thank you all for coming out tonight and spending this time with us. Thank you to Graciela um, and Mia Park Street Library for hosting us this evening. Um, thank you all for coming out on Connecticut Explorer for also hosting us. Um, and uh, thank you guys so much. Let's Stay in touch. Please sign it in if you haven't, um, so that we can stay in touch and share more resources and programs.